There's a building program going on in heaven. Construction carried out by God's own hand. 1,500 miles wide, mansions standing side by side. The streets are paved with gold throughout the land. And now they say there'll be no dying in that city. No sickness and no sorrow will be no And the choir sing. Don't you want to touch an Elsgard hand that brought this great salvation plan? Can't you feel it stirring in your soul? Don't you want to go? Don't go, don't you want to go? You know, I have many loved ones waiting over yonder. And how I long to see my precious father there. And all the saints will gather in, immortal bodies free from sin. As we praise and you want to go with me to God's new city? And don't you want to hear that heavenly choir sing? Oh, heavenly choir sing. Don't you want to touch your nail scarred hand to brought this great salvation plan? Makes you feel the stirring in your soul. Don't you want to go? And don't you want to go with me to God's new city? And don't you want to hear Oh, heaven, the choir sing. Don't you want to touch an nail scarred hand that brought this great salvation plan? Can't you feel a stirring in your soul? Don't you want to go? Go, go, don't you want to go? Can't you feel a stirring in your soul? Don't you want to go? That's 1,500 miles wide. Oh, that's going to be a great homecoming day when we finally see the man who bled and died for us. Ain't you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Shame is a prison, yeah. cruel as a grave. Fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. There was a battle. War between death and life There on the cross The Lamb of God was crucified well, There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down Samson killed the beast. Moses led God's children down to the deep red sea. John rode about a horseman crossing the open sky. When that trumpet blows, the ground will open wide. Cause there ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave. Trumpet sound. Gonna get up out of that room. There ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. God said, Go down, Gabriel. Put your foot on the land and see. But don't you blow that trumpet until you hear from me. Well, I look way over yonder. And he's a coming after me. Cause there ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. There ain't no grave. 
gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound Gonna get up out of the that ground There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down Shame is a prison between death and life to there on the cross the Lamb, Lamb of God, God was crucified Hallelujah Amen Surely children weren't made for the streets and fathers were not made to leave Surely this isn't how it should be. Let your kingdom come. And surely nations were not made for war. Or the broken men to be ignored. Surely this just can't be what you saw. Let your kingdom come here in my heart. And I will live to carry your compassion, to love a world that's broken, to be your hands and feet. And I will give with the life that I've been given and go beyond religion. To see the world be changed by the power of your name. Surely life was not made to regret, and the lost were not made to forget. Surely faith without action is dead. Let your kingdom come. Lord, break this heart. And I will live to carry your compassion. To love a world that's broken. To be your hands and feet. And I will give with the life that I've been given. And go beyond religion to see the world be changed by the power of your name. I will live to carry your compassion, to love a world that's broken, to be your hands and feet. And I will give with the life that I've been given and go beyond religion to see this world be changed by the power of your name. burden weighing heavy is it all too much to carry well, let me tell you about my jesus we feel that empty feeling our shame's done all it's stealing are you desperate for some healing well, let me tell you about my jesus sing it church because he makes a way where there ain't no way and he rocks up from an empty grave there ain't no sinner that he can't save well, let me tell you about my jesus and his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me well, let me 
tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. A hallelujah, a hallelujah, a hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Jesus, Amen. we sing it to you, Lord. A hallelujah, a hallelujah, a hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Who could work it all out for your good? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. Cause he makes a way where there ain't no way. And he rises up from an empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't say. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. And he tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change oh, Jesus. your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Though the sun Amen. sets free, it's free indeed. No matter what the junk is that you wasted in. Oh, he's able. He's able. He's able. Take my cross to count, pay the price for my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Who would take my cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty? Who would care that much about me? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. Who would take my cross to Calvary, pay the price for all who will care that much about me? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. Who would take my cross to Calvary? Pay the price for all my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. Cause he makes a way where there ain't no way. And he rises up from an empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't say. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. And his love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Let him change your life today. Let him change your life today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Amen. Thank God forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to read the first four verses. We're going to talk about the verse 3 and verse 4. Amen. I thought Jessica was going to quote exactly what I was going to speak about today. She just was the chapter before it. Amen. But you couldn't have chapter 4 if you didn't have chapter 3. Amen. Thank God. Chapter 3 begins though, in this verse. There are coming the last days perilous times. For men will be lovers of themselves. Proud boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affections. Amen. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. I'm going to tell you, don't never be guilty of denying the power of God. Because God's power has never been diminished. It's never ended. Amen. And He's still the God that has all power both in heaven and in earth. And then Paul is actually writing to a young preacher. And if you read the rest of chapter 4, you're going to find out that Paul is actually incarcerated, that Nero has passed this uh, death sentence on him, and Paul knows that he's going to die very soon. So he's critiquing this young preacher, this young son of the faith named Timothy about what to do. And Paul is warning what's going to happen, amen, in the last days. And we're living the last days, amen. 
But anyway, he said, I charge, and that word charge actually means command thee. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that means the living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And then Paul said, preach the word. So he tells Timothy what he needs to be doing in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. And he says to preach the word. And he said when you preach the word, there's going to be times that this word that you preach that people will receive it. And there's times they're going to reject it. But he said, don't matter, just preach it anyway. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, and this is what the word of God does. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Amen. With all long suffering and doctrine. And Timothy, here is why you need to do that. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust or desires shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Father, as we humbly come into your presence now, we ask that you would add your blessings to the reading of the Bible, the Word of God. And we pray, Lord, that you would help me for the next few minutes to glean great and eternal truths uh, that would help this church and move us, God, uh, as a people to a higher level. And Almighty God, we pray, amen, uh, that you would uh, help us, Lord, to be a people of discernment, knowing good from evil, God. And I pray this morning that you would drive back every hindrance out of this place and let the glorious light of the gospel go forth, God. Let us and anoint us and let our tongue become the pen of a ready writer to speak as the oracles of God. And Lord, as we go forward in this service, amen, with open Bible and open hearts, let us receive the engrafted word that we may grow thereby and we'll never fail to give you praise honor and glory for we ask it all in Jesus name and let the church of the living God shout amen. amen while you're being seated all of the building I want to title this message and then after I title this message I want to give you at least uh, maybe three different translations of the word that I just read not because uh, the Bible needs it because I think that it clarifies uh, a lot of things that Paul is saying but what we're going to be talking about for the next few minutes uh, is the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, wasn't given to make us feel good it was it, it, it was given so that it makes us be able to be good. Amen. And that's what everybody that is gathered together in the house of God. Amen. You wouldn't believe over the years how many people amen that has come through this door of this church and they'd say Brother Bellamy, amen I need to do better. I'm going to tell you something church the only one that can make us do better is the son of the living God. Amen but he can do it, thank God. But the voice translation says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, because a time will come when some will no longer tolerate sound teaching. Instead, they will live by their own desires. Amen. They'll scratch their itching ears by surrounding themselves with teachers who oppose, who oppose, amen, who does not oppose their lifestyles. Amen. And tell them, them what they want to hear. Amen. I hope that you walked in this building today wanting to hear the Word of God because the Word of God is what's going to set us free. It tells us how to live. The Word of God will prepare us to die in its final authority on what lies beyond this door. And then the verse 4 of the voice translation says they will turn away from the real truth you have to, you have to offer because they prefer the sound of faith and myths. The Passion Translation says, for the time is coming when they will no longer listen to and respond to the healing words of truth because they will become selfish and pride. They will seek out teachers with soothing words that line up with their desires, saying just what they want to hear. And they will close their eye ears to the truth and believe nothing but fables and myths. The Message Translation says, in second 
Timothy 4 and verse 3, uh, it says you're going to find that there will be times uh, when people will not, will not uh, have no stomach for solid teaching, uh, but will fill up on spiritual junk food, uh, catchy opinions uh, that tickle their fancies. Uh, well, I want to tell you something, church. Uh, this preacher didn't walk in this building this morning, uh, amen, to give you some kind of catchy opinion, uh, amen, so that you can leave here feeling good. Uh, I have failed the Almighty God. If I don't preach the Bible under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost in a way that will make all of us want to do good. Hallelujah to God. Listen, God deserves it. The Bible teaches us that we're not our own, but we've been bought by a price by the precious blood of Jesus. And I'm glad that I don't belong to me. I'm glad that I belong to Him. Hallelujah to God. And I've staked my eternal destiny on that very thing. So the gospel was given not to make us feel good, but to make us desire to be good. Amen. Or to be better. Amen. And the truth is, the message of the cross and of the gospel that Jesus Christ and the apostolic band began to spread all over the world. It wasn't a feel-good message, but it was a message that was straight from heaven, anointed by the Holy Ghost. Amen. It was a message Message uh, that made people want to do better. Uh, thank God. I remember when I was under the conviction of the Holy Ghost, uh, I would tell my closest friends, uh, man, I got to straighten up. Uh, I got to do better. Uh, hallelujah. Well, I want to tell you something. Uh, I tried to straighten up. Uh, I tried to do better. Uh, I tried to act better, uh, but I didn't straighten up uh, until I got a hold of the one uh, that can straighten you up. Uh, his name is Jesus Christ. Uh, he can change your life just like the song that they just sung. Amen. And here's what Jesus said. Listen church, amen. There, there's something you got to do man when you start following Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, it said then said Jesus unto his disciples if any man will come after me, if you're really going to follow me, he said, let him deny himself. Amen. It ain't all about you no more. Amen. If you're going to follow Jesus it's got a, but I don't like them it don't matter Jesus said to love your enemies and pray for them that despitefully use you and love your neighbor as yourself hallelujah I don't like my neighbor amen Jesus didn't say like them he said to love them amen I'm going to tell you church you can't love the unlovable without the help of God so Jesus said to deny yourself that means if you want to slap your neighbor upside the head, you need to deny yourself. Hey, you need to do, 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 do good for them. Do, overcome evil with good. Amen. Well, let me go on and talk a little while. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. And then he didn't stop there. He said, and take up your cross and follow me. I'm going to tell you, don't, don't get offended, but I'll tell you a lot of people need to pull the cross off of their neck and get on it. Amen. That's what Jesus said. Amen. I'm going to tell you that cross hanging on your neck ain't going to do nothing, but if you will take up the cross that Jesus Christ has given us to bear and bear it gladly because we're following him. Amen. We will follow him to Gethsemane. We will follow him to the sepulcher. Amen of Joseph of Arimathea. We'll follow him to Calvary. And if we'll follow him all the way one glorious day, we're going to follow him into the air when he comes in the clouds to receive us unto himself that where we, he is there we may be also. And Jesus said, amen, he said this to the masses who witnessed, amen, him feed in 5,000. We've been talking about that a whole lot. Matthew chapter 14 that story is recorded John chapter 6 that story is recorded Jesus took five barley loaves two small fishes a lad's meal amen and fed 5,000 men plus women and children he sent the multitudes away sent the disciples across the sea amen went up on the mountain and there alone and began to pray but I want you to know something them people now you need to hear what I'm telling you amen when Jesus fed the masses with two, five loaves of bread and two small fishes the truth is 
Hey, man, most of the people, if not all of them, that was there on that fateful day actually partook of that meal. And you can see that in John chapter 6, verses 25 through 29. The Bible says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, Amen, uh, when camest thou thither? So what they done, they followed Jesus from the mountainside on, on the shore of the lake and, and, and they, they seen that Jesus multiplied the loaves filled by 5,000 men and women. Jesus said, now y'all go away. And, and he went up on the mountain. They seen the 12 apostolic band climb in a boat and head across the sea and then they can't find Jesus. And the Bible says that when they found Jesus on the other side of the lake because Jesus Jesus uh, walked on the water. They asked him, Jesus, how in the world did you get here? How did you get hither? And you know what the question was? How did you get on the other side of the lake, Jesus? And Jesus didn't say, man, I walked on water. You ought to have seen it. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't say there was this awful storm and the disciples were about to drown uh, and the ship was about to sink and I took off on that water. Had no old boat. Uh, had no other way to get to them. Uh, and I took off on the water on the storm uh, and I went to the disciples so I could save them. Uh, and that's how I got here. That's what they're asking. How did you get here? And Jesus didn't bother to tell them, uh, amen, what a miracle he performed by defying the laws of gravitation and walking on the water. But Jesus answered and said, he gave them an answer, it just wasn't what they was asking. He said, barely, barely, or truly, truly, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the, saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. There you have it. Buddy, they seen, uh, they seen that five loaves of bread, two small fishes uh, in the hands of a miracle working God uh, fed 5,000 people. And Jesus said, you didn't follow me because of the miracle. You followed me because you just wanted some, another meal. Amen. And see, it just told us that they had eaten of that miraculous meal. Praise God. He said, you ate a miracle meal. But he said, I'm going to tell you about eating this miracle meal that you're seeking me after because of. He said, this meal, amen, even though you ate it and it was a miracle, you're going to experience hunger again. And Jesus said, labor not. How many people waste their entire life working about an actor and trying to achieve something that ain't going to amount to nothing? Amen. Thank God forever. I'm going to just tell you something, church. Uh, you are who you are. Listen, uh, they'll, I, I'll tell you a quick story and move on because I want to preach this out today. But I had, I had a really good friend. Uh, he, he was a Jordanian. And we'd go to staff meetings and his name was Amar Shubar. Amen. We'd call him Sugar Bear. It's easier to say. No offense. But every time we'd go to a staff meeting, he would always sit with me when we'd go out to eat our evening meal. And I, I'd say, hey, Mar, I said, I want to bless this foot. That's okay. And my bow, I don't know what his religion was. I don't know what he believed in. I don't know if he was a Muslim or a Christian or what he was. I just know what I am. And I'd say, I want to bless this food. And I'd bow my head, pray over that food. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And then we'd enjoy our meal. I was going to Maysville, Kentucky one morning before daylight. My phone rung. He said, I want to tell you something, Gary. I read an article this weekend. It, it said, it, the, he said, if you ever hear the old saying uh, that money changes people. I said, I've heard it all my life. He said, I read an article and said, that ain't right. Money don't change people. Hey, Amen. Money reveals people. He said, they the same old jerk they was uh, when they was broke. They just didn't have the means to mistreat people. Uh, I want to tell you something, church. Uh, it don't matter how much money you got, uh, what position you hold. Uh, hey, Amen. What does matter is who is reigning in your heart. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. You just the same old you until Jesus Christ gets a hold of you. But I want to tell you about a Jesus that can tra tra uh, change a Simon into a Peter and a Saul into a Paul. And I don't know who you are, where you come from, or what you're going through. He can change you. If you believe it, shout amen. Thank God forever. So I've never forgot that. Money don't change people. It reveals people. Authority and position don't change people. Hey, man, it just reveals them. I'm going to tell you something. 
If I'd have got the position that I had when I retired when I was 28 year old, I'd have probably got fired and got a half dozen people destroyed because I was too young to, to uh, have what I could have got at that time. It's amazing when you get a little bit older. Things, ain't, things that you think so important ain't important at all. And then others never learn. But let me preach on. God can help them. But let's go on. The Bible says, He said, labor not. What are you working for? These people, I don't, listen, I don't know how they got around that lake. They may have walked around it, may have uh, took a boat across it. They just got to the other side. They found Jesus, amen, and they want to know how you got here. Amen, I'd like to know how you got here, but that's not, not important. What's important is what you're going to do with your life in Jesus once you've got here, amen. And Jesus didn't say, I've walked on the water to get here. He said, I want to tell you, amen, you, you ain't over here because I'm a miracle working God. You're over here because you want to know another free meal. And he said, I want to tell you something. Labor not for the meat which perisheth. Uh, amen. You ate a miracle meal, but you're going to experience hunger. He said, but for that, uh, that, uh, that meat, listen to me. He said, I'm going to tell you about some meat you need to hear about. But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Uh, amen. Which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. He said, I'm telling you what you need to be looking for is something that ain't going to wear out, run out, amen, leave you out, but something that'll last forever. And he said, I got what you need and I'll give it to you. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? That's a question that most of us ask from time to time. And we all can do what the work of God is. Amen. What must I do? They said, look here, Jesus, what must I do that we might do the work of God? No doubt they was referring about multiplying, but multiplying loaves and multiplying small fish. Amen. But Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Everybody that's in this service this morning, you can believe on Jesus. Amen. And if you truly believe on Jesus, then you're doing the work of God. Jesus said this, this multitude, they had a real good, amen, as he talked to them, they had this really, really good conversation about food. They, they was viewing it as natural food. Five loaves, two fishes, 5,000 men fed. Amen. Thank God forever. And when Jesus was actually teaching them about what would endure, amen, and would last them and would feed their spirit man forever. And we get messed up on that sometimes. And then Jesus, if you study John chapter 6, amen, he begins to tell them that your fathers did eat manna that fell from heaven. And, and they're dead now. He said, but if any man eat my flesh and drink my blood, and he ain't talking about being accountable. Amen. Jesus never, never contradicts the Bible. Amen. In the book of Leviticus, it tells us that it's a sin to eat blood because life is in the blood. So if they know half as much about the Bible as they thought they knowed about the Bible, they would know that Jesus was talking about something other than human flesh and human blood. He said, but except a man eat my flesh and drink my blood, he has no part in me. He's saying, you got to partake of me. Amen. you got to deny yourself. Take up your cross. you got to follow me. And look what happens in John 6 verse 58 through 60. Amen. This is that bread. He said, I want to tell you. Amen. I want to tell you about the real bread. Jesus, the real bread was born in Bethlehem, which is the house of bread, and his name is Jesus. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Amen. And the Bible says not as, it ain't the bread like your father's ate uh, the manna and are dead. Listen, I want to tell you something, church. Uh, hey Amen. Manna come from heaven, but anna, manna was really natural food. It was, it was natural food. It tastes like corridor seed, uh, even though it come from God out of heaven. Hey Amen. But let me tell you something. Uh, Jesus said, look, your fathers eat manna that God fed them and they're dead. Uh, he said, he that eateth of this bread, uh, hey Amen, the body of Christ, uh, he said, shall live forever. And these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And many therefore of his disciples, everybody shout disciples, that's somebody following Jesus. That's somebody enrolled under a teacher. Amen. And, and many therefore of his disciples when they heard this, they said this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Man, we can't accept this kind of preaching. And then Jesus in verse 66 says from that time many of his disciples, everybody shout disciples, Many of his disciples went back 
and walk no more with him. Amen. Praise God forever. Walk no more with him. Amen. In verse 67 through verse 69, then said Jesus unto the 12, will you also go away? I wonder if he's talking to anybody today. I wonder what he's saying to you here now in this service today. Then Jesus said unto the 12, after all these others walked away because of the message that was preached, uh, amen. He said, will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? I'm going to tell you where a lot of people go. They go to the to the alcohol, the, 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 the booze and the drugs and the neon lights and the dance halls. But I'm going to tell you right now, you ain't going to find it there. Amen. You'll never find what you're looking for in the bottom of a bottle. Hallelujah. I'll tell you where you'll find what you're looking for. It's on bended knees at an altar before the Son of the living God. The way, the truth, and the life. The only way we can get to heaven. Amen. Amen. Will you also go away? Peter said, Lord, my God of heaven, uh, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Paul warned young preacher Timothy in verse 4 that we read as our text in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Amen. Now imagine this, church. Just imagine this, Paul is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he said, Timothy, there's coming a time that people's going to turn away from this Bible, this Word of God. Amen. They're going to turn away their ears from the truth. Amen. The words, the truth. Amen. And it says, and they're going to be turned unto fables. Now imagine this, walking into a church with a pastor whose only message is a feel-good message that is all about, uh, amen, something that's not real. He's just talking a fable, a fairy tale, amen. And I begin to thank God, what is a fable anyway? And I really love the last part that I'm going to share with you of this definition of a fable from a Greek, from Greek and Latin. The two, 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 this word that I'm giving you the definition, I'm giving you the Greek definition for fable and the Latin fascin- uh, uh, definition. It means a, a tale. Amen. Fake news. <laughs> Amen. A tale. Fiction. A finged. Uh, a uh, 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 story tale. Amen. The word finge means to invent or to imagine, to form an ideal or a conception of something not real. A fable is a tale intended to instruct or amaze. Amen. Praise God forever. <clears throat> but then <clears throat> one definition says that a fable is something or a word that is used to soften a lie. You know, when I say, well, that's a fable, that ain't near as offensive as I say, that's a lie. I mean, that's offensive, church. But I love that definition. You know, they people lives a lie. They ain't who they say they are. Jesus called them hypocrites. Amen. You know what? That Pharisee standing in that temple, amen, and he began to brag himself to heaven. Amen. He talked about he paid tithes, amen, of all he had. He fasted twice a week, and hey, you know, that's probably all the truth. But then he began to thank God that he wasn't like this publican over here. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. I thank God I ain't like that Pharisee over there. Because if I get to heaven, church, it ain't going to be because I earned it. It's going to be because of the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. But let me get back on track. Amen. Remember what it said that a fable was? It says it was a, a fable is a tale intended to instruct or amuse. How many has ever heard of Charles Haddon Spurgeon? Amen. <clears throat> Great preacher of yesteryear, many yesteryears, a century ago. Amen. Praise God. But his messages are still prevalent today. But Charles Haddon Spurgeon, when he preached his message, and the message of his title was Feed My Sheep. It was taken from John's Gospel, chapter 21 and verse 17. The title of the message was Feed My Sheep. And in the course of that message, you know what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said? 
He said, amen, he said that, uh, that there was that a time will come when instead of shepherds or pastors feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this to you with sadness in my heart. I report to you this day, amen, that it has come to futrition in our day. Much of the church has totally forgotten the words of the great prince of preachers, Paul, when he said in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 through 32, he said, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock of God over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know Know this, Paul said, that after my departing shall grievous wolves, a wolf is an enemy to the sheep, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves, he said, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And then Paul gave the remedy. Paul told us and warned us and said what is going to happen in the church in the last days. But he gives us a remedy of this problem that the church would be facing. And it's answered in verse 31 and 32. Paul said, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the Word, not fables, but to the Word of His grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. And back to this definition of a fable. A fable is a fictitious, uh, a, a man, uh, uh, story <clears throat> that somebody uses uh, to enforce some precept. Uh, it's an idle story. It's a falsehood. And once again, let me give you the best definition to me. It's a softer term for a lie. It's a softer term for a lie. And a brief study of the New Testament church will reveal that the church's message was a spe exactly what the writer of Hebrews said. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the Bible says that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <clears throat> One translation says that the Word of God is active and, and alive, and I say amen. Paul said in Romans 1 and 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But I really like what the Passion Translation says in Romans 1 and 16. It says, I refuse to be ashamed of the wonderful message of God's liberating power unleashed in us through Christ. That's, that's good. And it says, for I am thrilled to preach that everyone who believes is saved. You know, like people go to church and try to figure out who's lost. Man, I ain't trying to figure out who's lost. I'm trying to figure out a way that God can flow through me and help people get saved. Amen. I told somebody last night, but I read it years ago. I use it in almost every funeral service that I'm called on to to speak in. And I read this, and this gentleman, this preacher, this fellow worker in God's kingdom, he said, when we get to heaven, heaven's going to be a great eye opener and a great mouth shutter. And what he was saying, you know, you're going to see people in heaven that you didn't give a chance to get there, but God got them there. And when you get to heaven, amen, you're going to shut your big mouth because there's going to be people ain't there that sit on the deacon board and you thought they surely going to make it and they ain't going to make it, amen. And you say, how can you say that? Well, I preached a revival in a neighboring county a few years ago and, and I didn't save them. God did. There was 11 people got saved in that week's revival and thank God for every one of them. And one of them was a deacon. He come to the altar, give his heart to Jesus, and, and, and you know, I'm just, I, after service, I shook his hand. He said, Preacher, I need to tell you something. He told how many years he'd been a deacon. He said, But I was lost. I'm telling you, they deacons in church that's lost. I want to tell you, they people standing behind the pulpit preaching the word, and they're lost. 
I'm not judging them. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. Amen. Thank God. They people singing in the choir and they lost. They people teaching Sunday school and they lost. Uh, but I'll tell you somebody that wants to find them. Uh, Jesus said that he come to seek uh, and to save them which is lost. Amen. And if you're in church today and you're lost, I'm telling you, you're in the right place because God is after you and he's seeking you and he wants to find you. Amen. Because he wants to save you. He does. Amen. But look what it said there in the Passion Translation. It says, For I am thrilled to preach that everyone that who believes is saved. To the Jew first and then to people everywhere. Now, most Bible students who study the Bible much at all will heartily agree that the New Testament church actually had its birth and beginning on the day of Pentecost. In the upper room where 120 believers were baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The Bible says that suddenly there came from heaven the, a sound, uh, amen, of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 3 says in Acts chapter 2, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set upon each of them. Then they got touched by that other world. They was filled with the third person of the Godhead. And that 120 apostolic band walked down out of that upper room into the streets of Jerusalem. And Peter and the eleven began to herald the mighty message of the risen Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I want to share with you what an effect this message had on people. Amen. In Acts 2, verse 37 through 39, uh, amen, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, uh, they were pricked in their hearts. Uh, amen. Pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what must we do? Uh, and then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, uh, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, uh, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off to as many as the Lord our God shall call and after that Peter and John amen they was going into the temple of the air of prayer getting ready to head through the beautiful gate they saw a crippled man there they got that crippled man healed by the power of God and the Bible says in Acts 4 1 and 2 and as they spake they begin to preach again and as they begin to speak unto the people the priest and the the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead and after the beautiful gate experience amen there was the ordination amen of people and then the Bible tells us that amen brother after they seen Peter and John and what Jesus done through them they said that Peter just walked down the street and they put out people that was sick and demon possessed if even his shadow would overcast them. Uh, amen. They'd be delivered and healed. Uh, in Acts chapter 5 verse 17 and 18. Uh, amen. What happened then? Uh, it says then the high priest rose up uh, and all they that were with him which is the, the sect of the Sadducees and were filled with indignation. Laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And then they had church trouble. How I many know sometimes you have church trouble? You do. I mean, sometimes you got you got the buddy system, you got cliques, you got heresies, you got people that separates themselves from other people. Amen. And, and, and this happened in the church that had the best preachers, that had seen Jesus, and and the and the Hebrew widows were getting taken care of, and the Grecians or the Gentile women was on starvation, and they said, "Man, we got to do something about this." So they elected seven deacons. Look you out men that has a good report. Hey, listen, you don't want a womanizer on your board. You don't want a drunk on your board. You need to have somebody that they're saying is a good man over there. Put him on your board. Amen. Uh, of good report. Full of faith in the Holy Ghost. You don't need no doubters on your board. Thank God forever. Amen. You, you need people spirit led on your board. Amen. That's what it says. But let me get to what I want to tell you. In verse uh, chapter 7, verse 54. Amen. They ordained seven deacons. Amen. And then it talks about the miracles of Stephen. It says, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on Stephen with their teeth. 
So let's recap what I just said to you that the effect the Word of God had on to these people. Amen. Unto the masses. In Acts 2.37, it says when the Word was pre- uh, preached, it, they were pricked in their heart. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 2, the Bible says that they were grieved. In Acts uh, 5 or, or, or 4 or, or chapter 5 and verse uh, 8, 17, the Bible says they were filled with indignation. And then in Acts 5, 54, or 7, 54, it says they were cut to the heart. That's what the Word of God will do to you. Amen. Amen. It really will. <clears throat> now, I'm getting ready to close, but I'm going to share some things with you. I'm going to slow down. My wife's a better preacher than I am. She said, Gary, you ought to slow down. She said, you know what you're going to say, and everybody else don't, and they can't keep up with you. <clears throat> well, go to Facebook. Go to Providence Pentecostal Church live streaming. Play the message. You can stop it anytime you want to. If you don't get it, you can slow me down mechanically. But I don't know if you got a chance, amen, to do it physically. But I want to close with some thoughts. I want to talk to you a little while. I'm brutally honest with what I'm telling you. <clears throat> amen. In Acts chapter 8, remember Philip. He was one of them deacons. He had four daughters that were prophetess and they were virgins and, 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 de- and Philip was a deacon <clears throat> and he got over there in Samaria and he got to preaching. And when he got to preaching, people got to getting saved and getting healed and, 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 and then they called for Peter and John to come over there and lay hands on them because they knew they needed the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> And the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 21, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hand the Holy Ghost was given, uh, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay my hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So Simon is like a lot of people today. He thought he could buy it. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, you can't buy your way into heaven. It don't matter if you're the biggest tie payer in this church and the wealthiest individual in this county, your money can't get you to heaven. <clears throat> your money may very possibly hinder you from going to heaven Amen. if you believe what the Bible says. But let me go on off of that. Then Peter said, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thou, thy heart is not right with God. He said, you ain't right, buddy. Amen. Then we go on in Acts chapter 8 and verse 34. And this is really amazing to me how Philip, amen, he's in this revival in Samaria, <clears throat> and, and, and uh, God sends him over there, amen, in a desert place in Gaza. He sent him from a, from a thriving revival to a desert because there was one man that needed to get saved. He left the masses to save the one. He left the 99 in the wilderness to go over there and save the one in the desert. And the Bible says in Acts 8 and 34, and the eunuch answered Philip, Amen. He's reading from Isaiah chapter 53 and, and, and he's reading this and he don't know who he's reading about. And Philip, and, he, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man. And then Philip opened his mouth, verse 35, and began at that scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Amen. So Philip, the eunuch, wanted to experience him. Simon wanted to buy him. Philip, or the eunuch, wanted to experience him. And then we go to Acts chapter 24, verse 24 and 5. And after certain days when Felix with his wife Drusilla, which being a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ. And as Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. He got under conviction. He shook under the conviction of God. And he answered, Go thy way, for this time, when I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. So Philip wanted to serve, or Felix wanted to serve Jesus at his convenience. And then in Acts 26, verse 27 and 8, Paul says to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me 
to be a Christian. So Agrippa was almost persuaded, and I want him to come and get us a song, and I want to talk to you. And I want to recap what I've just said from the Scripture. Simon wanted to buy it. The eunuch wanted to experience it. Then we have Felix wanting to serve God at his convenience. And finally, we have Agrippa who was almost persuaded. Now the God's truth is, if you're in this building today and you're lost, every lost soul that darkens the face of this world falls under these four categories. Some people wants to buy it. Others wants to experience it. While many wants to put it off because it's just not convenient right now. And then finally, there's a multitude who is almost persuaded. And if that's you, I want to talk to you just for a couple minutes. Do you know you are a prophetic statistic in the Bible? If you're almost persuaded. The prophet Joel said this in the third chapter of the book that bears his name in the 14th verse. He said, multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. Almost persuaded. Should I stay out or should I get in? They're in the valley of decision. And here's the sobering statement. He said, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And you know what? If you're lost in this building today, you're going to make a decision. I'm not convinced it'll be the right decision, but if you're lost, you will make a decision because this is where the rubber meets the road. You're going to either decide I'm coming to Christ or I'm going to stand up and walk out of this building and trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God. And that's the wrong choice. I'm going to tell you the greatest decision that I ever made in my life wasn't the career that I chose. It wasn't the wife that I chose. It wasn't the community that I live in. The greatest decision that I ever made in my life was whenever Jesus knocked and I decided to open my heart and let him in. And I'm going to tell you something. Once I did that, and I'm bragging on nobody but the loving God, the goodness of God that le led me to him, all them other decisions just started working better. I'm going to tell you, the third day of next month, which is just a few days off, me and my wife will celebrate our 46th anniversary. And you know, if I hadn't got saved, that marriage might have ended in a divorce. You don't ever know. You may have hung out at the wrong place. You may have made a poor decision, wrong choice, and did something that was going to destroy your future. And God <clears throat> graced me with three biological sons and we raised Marlin over here from five year old on. But you know what they can't tell you? They can't tell you, and it don't make me good, buddy. I'm just going to tell you, God makes you good. They can't tell you if they ever seen their daddy take a drop of alcohol, smoke a cigarette, slap their mama around, bust up the furniture, amen, go waste a paycheck on the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know what all they know about that me? Go to church. But I just want to tell you something, church. Serving God not only gives you an opportunity to go to heaven, it makes your life better until you get there. You'll be a better spouse. You'll be a better parent. You'll be a better employee. You'll be a better neighbor. You'll be a better person in your community. You'll just be better. And I'm going to tell you, God sent this gospel not to make us feel better, he sent it so we can be better. And I'm telling you right now, if God's speaking to your heart, don't be almost persuaded. You need God more than God needs you. 
God don't need you. God wants you. I want to say that again. God don't need us. God wants us. God could be God without us. But God wants us. He wants us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, and that's you, would believe in Him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. 